The elegant dark wooden door swung open and a young woman walked into Marcus Daly's luxurious study. From her appearance and expression, it was immediately clear that something was wrong again. Dad, she exclaimed. Something happened. Marcus asked, taking off his glasses, you're distracting me from work. Dad, that awful woman is up to something again. What now? The man asked with a sigh, his voice calm but tense. Have you invented another story? Invented. The girl mimicked in surprise. Dad, are you kidding? You never believe me. How am I supposed to believe some fairy tale about how she's allegedly bullying you? Marcus frowned. Vivian, I've seen how she treats you and it has nothing to do with your fantasies. She's always polite and kind, especially to you. What are you trying to achieve? I don't understand. Vivian looked at her father indignantly, her eyes wide open. Fine, Dad. Let's drop the subject. I just overheard her phone conversation. Tell me, who besides you would she be talking to in such a sweet, shy voice saying, Well, I don't know when we can meet. What? Marcus leaned forward. Vivian, are you delirious? No, Dad, I'm telling you what I heard with my own ears. The girl shouted. Vivian, sorry, but this is crossing all boundaries. I was afraid to tell you earlier, but now seems like the right moment. Grace and I are expecting a baby. Vivian's eyes widened even more. They were filled with astonishment mixed with a hint of disgust and revulsion. What? she asked, frowning. Dad, did I hear that right? No, Vivian, you heard correctly. Grace and I are having a baby. Not soon, but we are. And considering this, I'm even more inclined to trust her. Even if she were not like that, as you put it, and wanted to somehow set us up or undermine us, she wouldn't agree to it. We have a good, happy family. And you, Vivian, are unnecessarily trying to belittle Grace in my eyes. Don't you get enough attention? Vivian had listened all this time without interrupting. Her expression made it clear that she was struggling to grasp the point Marcus was trying to make and was barely processing the information in her mind. Dad, she said finally then, turning towards the door, added, I get it. When she shows her snake-like nature, you'll remember my words and regret not listening to me. The daughter was on the verge of tears, and to avoid her father seeing her weakness, she ran out of the room. Marcus sighed and began thinking about how to fix the situation. Vivian had always been quite sensitive since childhood, needing special attention, but after her mother's death, she had changed rapidly. That day seemed to promise success for his business. Everything was going according to plan. His business, which he had started, a small clothing store, was slowly starting to generate income. His wife, Sophie, always tried to support him and gave various advice as an economist. Marcus, who was a chef by profession, had little understanding of business before starting his own, so his first wife had helped him a lot. Good morning. His already prepared wife said, waking Marcus up energetically. Wake up, we have very good news. What good news could there be at? He glanced at the clock on the nightstand. At ten minutes past eight in the morning, Mr. Fisher himself wrote to us. She pointed upward. He said he sees huge potential in our store and wants to meet and discuss something. Marcus immediately sprang out of bed. Ralph Fisher, he asked. Wow, what potential did he see in our store? I'm shocked too. He said our location is good with high traffic. You know, we've had a noticeable increase in customers lately. Anyway, I'm going now, she said, reaching for her phone. He scheduled a meeting at a cafe. We'll discuss something, but I have a suspicion that he, 
she gestured with her hands, suggesting he finish the sentence. Wants to collaborate with us. Marcus confidently continued. Yes. Sophie exclaimed joyfully, clapping her hands. Can you believe it? Ralph Fisher himself sees potential in us. We can't miss this opportunity. While I'm going to the meeting with him, take Vivian to school. And stop by the teacher. She wanted to talk to us. Vivian has somehow lost her previous academic performance and started being rebellious. All right, I'll take her. What could have happened? Marcus asked as he got out of bed. I don't know, she's complaining that Vivian was doing well, but now she's involved with some company from another class and stopped trying. She only explained it briefly. Okay, I'll check with her, Marcus said, feeling slightly embarrassed. Strange, Vivian always wanted to study. Well, yes, I'll talk to. He awkwardly paused. Miss Casey. Sophie suggested, pressing her lips together and sharply placing her cream on the vanity. So, am I beautiful? She turned to her husband, who had been standing beside her all this time. You're always the most beautiful to me, he said with a smile, extending his arms to hug her. No hugs, I'm late, she replied, and turning around, ran out of the room. Kisses. Don't miss me, I'll be back soon. All right. Marcus shouted down the corridor and stood smiling in place. What am I waiting for? He thought. He heard the front door slam and realized he needed to get Vivian ready for school. The day started off really well, and Marcus was already beginning to think about the rapid growth of his business. He didn't yet know all the pitfalls of running his own business, so he hoped Ralph Fisher might help them before their store reached a serious level. Fisher was a plump, middle-aged man who had quickly developed his business in textiles and clothing. Marcus didn't understand what potential Mr. Fisher saw in their small store beyond a good location but knew that Fisher knew more about private trade than he did. In the morning, Marcus dropped Vivian off at school and approached Miss Casey. Good morning, he began, slowly approaching her as she filled out teacher's records at her desk. Oh, Mr. Daly. Hello, exclaimed the forty-year-old woman. I wanted to talk to you about your daughter, Vivian, regarding her studies and behavior. Vivian. Marcus called out to his daughter, who had already taken her seat. Come here. The girl stood up from her desk and walked over to her father. You see, Miss Casey began, Vivian used to be a very good and diligent student. We all had high hopes for her, but lately, for some reason, Vivian has gone off track, gotten involved with a bad company from another class, and has been dragged down by them. Vivian, what's going on? Why is Miss Casey complaining about you? Marcus looked sternly at his daughter. In response, she pouted. And it's not just me, Mr. Daly. Your Vivian has driven Mrs. Winks, the math teacher, to a nervous breakdown. She threw papers all over the classroom, and when she was reprimanded, she started being rude. Now Mrs. Winks is on sick leave. Vivian. Marcus looked even more sternly at his daughter. Dad, so what? The girl seemed to have a sudden outburst. I didn't do anything forbidden. I threw a few papers, big deal. And Mrs. Wink started yelling. Well, I answered back. Neither Miss Casey nor Marcus expected such a retort from a sixth grader. Marcus furrowed his brow in deep astonishment. Vivian, what did you just say? Miss Casey said, slightly exaggerating her stress level, theatrically clutching her heart. The girl grabbed her backpack and briskly left the classroom in an unknown direction. Sorry, excuse me, Marcus said. Sorry, and rushed out of the classroom after Vivian. Further lessons were out of the question. 
Marcus felt very embarrassed about his daughter. While they were driving in the car, he called Miss Casey, apologized again for the incident, and said he would have a disciplinary talk with his daughter. Vivian, what's happened to you? Marcus finally started the conversation, glancing at the rearview mirror at his daughter's sullen face. Why are you behaving like this? What company are you involved with? Violet Chain and Dennis Ashley. Vivian replied defiantly. Ashley? I remember her father. Well, you've certainly found yourself some friends. Do you know who her father is? No. Her father was my former classmate. He got out of prison last year he was there for theft. And his wife, bless her heart, took him back into the family. Do you think a former convict can have a law-abiding child? I don't know. The daughter answered very dryly. Well, let me tell you, dear. He can, but only if he has no involvement in raising the child. And here... Imagine the child's father is taken away in childhood and then returned a few years later. And of course the child who missed his dad all this time will start to pick up his mannerisms and behavior even more actively. Do you understand? Vivian said nothing. Marcus tried to conduct this dialogue as delicately as possible, but he wasn't succeeding very well. Why did you stop studying properly? What else am I supposed to do, Dad? She seemed to burst out again. Well, back in fifth grade, we were getting used to new teachers. They weren't so annoying yet, but now. She rolled her eyes and clicked her tongue. Marcus always tensed when she did that in his presence, but it annoyed him even more when it was in response to his words. What? What's happening now? Narrowing his eyes, he looked again at the rearview mirror. Nothing. Vivian answered rudely. No, I don't understand anything at all. Maintaining this conversation delicately was now noticeably harder. All right, I can understand being rude to teachers, but being rude to parents, Vivian. Your mother and I didn't raise you like this. In response, the girl just remained silent, staring out the window. You've really gone off the rails, the father continued. It's time to take this matter into your own hands because if it's neglected, I don't know what will happen. First, the loss of pocket money. If that doesn't help, we'll have to act more harshly. Do you understand me? Vivian still remained silent, which only made Marcus more frustrated. I'm asking you again, do you understand me? Fine. The daughter replied aggressively. For the rest of the drive home, neither of them said a word. Only when they were approaching the apartment, stopping at a long traffic light, Marcus thinking about something and looking out the window, said your mother will be so upset when she finds out. Yes, you're really disappointing us. He said this very tiredly, as if showing Vivian that he had cooled down, and she might say something too. But she still remained silent. Thinking that his daughter might be under a lot of stress, Marcus decided not to continue with the moralizing comments. They continued their drive in silence. When they got home, Vivian immediately took off her shoes and ran to her room, closing the door behind her. Her father went to the kitchen to have a cup of coffee and consider his next steps. He didn't want to increase the tension, as it might lead to a temporary, but still significant, loss of positive connection with his daughter. But something needed to be done. The ability to negotiate is a good trait for a successful businessman, he said to himself. And negotiating with a teenager is much harder than with Mr. Fisher when you're offering him something, not the other way around. Marcus thought a little more and decided that finding a compromise was necessary. But first, he should discuss the situation with his wife. He glanced at the war clock and realized that a lot of time had passed since Vivian left for her meeting with Mr. Fisher. He didn't know how long such business meetings typically lasted and suspected that his wife hadn't planned to stay out long. At the same time, he thought about calling her to ask when she would be home, 
but he worried that his call might interrupt an important conversation, so he hesitated about what to do. At the very least, I should call to let her know she should prepare to come home, Marcus thought, pulling out his phone and dialing his wife's number. Instead of hearing her pleasant, soft voice, he heard the voice of an answering machine, which informed him that the phone was temporarily unavailable. She must have turned it off, Marcus said aloud. Most likely the conversation is tense. To distract himself from the sudden anxiety, he lay down on the couch and turned on the TV. After flipping through channels for a while, he settled on a nature program. The calm voice of the narrator and the sounds of nature, combined with the coffee he drank, had a relaxing effect, and Marcus, without realizing it, gradually fell asleep. Of course, while he slept on the couch, he didn't hear the instant notification on his phone, Vivian had gone online. He woke up only when he heard the familiar ringtone and, looking at the screen, saw the word beloved accompanied by a red heart emoji. Hello, Vivian, are you all right? Marcus started to ask, but he was interrupted by an unfamiliar male voice. The tone and speed of the voice made it clear that the speaker was in a hurry. Are you Mr. Sophie Daly's husband? The hurried voice asked. Marcus's heart started to race. And you are, he asked warily. Your wife is currently in the intensive care unit. I'm an ICU doctor. She was in a terrible car accident and is in the hospital. The doctor continued. A cold wave of fear swept over Marcus. Hearing the hospital address, he jumped off the couch, shouted towards his daughter's room. I'll be back soon and ran out of the apartment. The chances of survival were slim. She had been on her way home, and as explained by the doctors, another car, driven by a drunk young man who later admitted he just decided to drive around the city, collided with hers. When Marcus arrived at the hospital, he was told what he had feared the most. The doctor explained that with such an accident, the chances of survival were almost non-existent, but they had done everything possible. Sitting in the office, in a comfortable leather chair, Marcus thought about how he should have found a compromise with his daughter. After Vivian's mother's death, she had tried to get closer to him, improved her school performance, stopped hanging out with a bad crowd, and had not disappointed him since then. This gave him confidence that she wouldn't start lying or disregarding his opinion again. But on the other hand was his current wife, Grace. They had met a year and a half ago in a restaurant, and at the beginning of their relationship Marcus had doubts that she was with him only for his money, but he later realized that their feelings were genuine. Their meeting had happened under strange circumstances. Marcus, tired after a long workday, decided to have dinner at a restaurant because he didn't have time to cook at home. He could have asked his daughter to prepare something, but she had said in the morning that she was going out with friends. The parking at the restaurant was convenient, and Marcus took a cosy table by the window. After ordering something new and appetizing, he was enjoying the view of the avenue when a slender, perfectly dressed woman with an aristocratic handbag draped over her shoulder walked into the restaurant. She looked like she was the owner, but she wasn't. As soon as she noticed the solitary man, she immediately headed towards his table. Are you alone? May I join you? She asked politely enough to make Marcus feel comfortable. The thing is, I always sit at this table, but now you're here. Yes, of course, sit down. Marcus didn't immediately realize she was talking to him. The lady sat down opposite him, placed her handbag on the seat next to her, and snapped her fingers to summon the waiter to her table. I'd like this dish, please, she said pompously, pointing at something on the menu and this, and some juice. That's all she closed the menu and handed it to the waiter. In response, she received the same phrase as Marcus. I'm sorry, but you'll have to wait a bit. The kitchen is busy and not keeping up. We apologize. No problem, the woman replied. I'll wait. As soon as the waiter left, Marcus, smiling, said, 
I was also told I'd have to wait. It would be a shame if your order arrives before mine. In response, the woman just giggled, adjusting her long, soft hair that was falling into her eyes, and said, Oh, I'm so tired after work. I completely understand. Marcus replied tiredly. And where do you work? The woman asked with interest. I own a large retail chain in the city. Marcus removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. We make and sell clothing. The staffing agency has hired such incompetence. Though why am I telling you my problems? Are you tired yourself? No, no, it's very interesting. The woman replied, I'm a fashion designer. I'm working on a new hoodie design. I'm deviating a bit from the assignment, but I understand that it will be in higher demand. I explain this to my boss, but he doesn't want to listen. Although the way I propose, it looks better and will sell more. They don't seem to understand anything and I'm amazed at how they end up in such places. The woman was expecting a reaction from her conversation partner, but when she saw that he just nodded understandingly to continue the conversation, she extended her hand to him. By the way, my name is Grace. And you? Marcus. He shook Grace's hand weakly. Nice to meet you. Likewise, Grace said shyly. Listen. Do you need any fashion designers for your retail chain? I'm planning to leave my current job. My boss is already driving me crazy. No, thank you, Marcus replied with a smile. We have good designers working for us. Our problem is with the marketers. They can't get anything right. Even the advertising, which is supposed to attract people, ends up driving customers away. I don't understand how they can work like that and they have diplomas from business schools and everything. It's all losses. They hired who knows what kind of people. It's a pity that you don't need designers, Grace said regretfully. I'd like to find a better job than my current one, otherwise it's just unbearable. Marcus didn't respond. He was really tired, and whenever he was in such a state, he couldn't say much. He didn't mind the beautiful conversation partner, but at that moment he just wanted to eat and sleep. After listening to Grace's complaints about her job and how her boss didn't understand anything about fashion design, Marcus was relieved when he finally saw the waiter approaching their table with a tray. Here's your order. Enjoy your meal, said the waiter, and turning on his heel, he hurried back to the kitchen. But Marcus's disappointment knew no bounds when he realized that the order was brought to his new acquaintance faster. Don't think about the bad. Thoughts are material, said the woman, giggling a little. Yeah, it seems unfair, he said, and also chuckled a bit at the situation. Here we are talking about bad bosses and bad sellers, and yet the real bad workers are right next to us. What do you mean? Grace asked, sipping her juice. The cooks. I ordered before you, yet you got your food faster. It's not right. Marcus said this without any malice in his voice, rather laughing at the situation which endeared him to the beauty. Yes, I agree, she replied, laughing. And Grace and Marcus continued chatting on various topics. Later, after they had dinner, the woman complained about having to wait a long time for a taxi, thus hinting to Marcus that he should give her a ride home. Marcus was a cultured man who always tried to be respectful to ladies, so despite his tiredness, he gave her a ride home. For a while after that meeting, they continued to see each other. Marcus liked this beautiful woman who had already made an impression on him. She then moved in with him met Vivian, with whom she got along reasonably well for a time. Then she became Grace Daly. At first it even seemed that it wouldn't cause any problems, but recently once his new wife had left her job, justifying it by saying she would focus on household affairs, Vivian started trying to convince her father that Grace was not right for him. 
Vivian was an adult girl and understood perfectly well that her father needed female attention, so she tried not to interfere with their relationship as long as everything was fine. But when she began to complain to her father that his new wife belittled and insulted her, her behavior started to change. Marcus heard all of Vivian's complaints about humiliation but tried to stay out of it. He loved both his daughter and his wife and didn't want to take sides completely. On one hand, he believed Vivian and understood that such things could indeed happen. But on the other hand, Grace's excuses that the daughter was just jealous also left Marcus with doubts. But now, considering the situation and remembering that incident on the day Sophie died, he decided to talk to Grace again. Putting on his glasses, he calmly got up from his chair and went downstairs to the kitchen, where Grace was currently. What happened with Vivian again? His wife asked, glancing briefly toward the stairs and then continuing to wash the dishes. She left the house. Marcus said sternly as he descended the stairs, I'm going to deal with this. Grace, why is Vivian complaining about you? This isn't the first time. She complains that you insult her, and now again. You're at it again, Marcus. The woman turned to face him. Her delicate dark hair was styled in a bun, and her beautiful brown eyes looked at her husband from beneath her brows. Yes, Grace, I am at it again. Marcus replied in the same calm tone. Vivian just told me that you were cooing with someone on the phone. Cooing? Grace asked, surprised. Yes, cooing. Who do you want to meet with? Marcus looked intently at his wife. Grace looked at her husband in confusion, but, feeling his intense, serious gaze, averted her eyes. Oh, it's nothing, she finally said. The gynecologist, Mr. Travis, called to ask about my health and when we could meet. I said I didn't know yet. It seems suspicious that the gynecologist calls you directly. Doesn't he have other patients? Marcus asked, slowly approaching her. Well, you know what my status is. You know who I'm married to. The woman tried to steer the conversation toward flirting, but it came off weakly. I know, my dear. So what? Marcus continued pressing. Mr. Travis understands the reputational damage it would cause him if something happened to me. There's nothing unusual about it. She reached into her pocket for her phone, unlocked it, and showed the call history. Look, Marcus saw the last contact. Mr. Travis, gynecologist. So why did Vivian say that you were speaking with him in a sweet, ingratiating voice? Marcus asked calmly. From the outside, it seemed he had no reason to be upset, but in reality, he had already formulated a plan for further action. Marcus, you understand that she's just jealous? Grace got angry. You give me more attention than her. Or she simply can't come to terms with the fact that I'm now in the role of her mother. Apparently not the best mother. Marcus pointed out and decided to end the conversation. All right, I'll talk to her again. I don't like all this. He was about to turn and go back to his room, but Grace grabbed his hand, darling. You're not angry with me, are you? She asked sweetly. I'm trying to please you in every way, and the fact that your daughter is constantly complaining about me. Dot, talk to her. Darling, I can't afford to be worried right now. Fine, I'll talk to her. Marcus replied coldly carefully pulling his hand from his wife's grasp. Returning to his study, he sat in his expensive office chair and leaned back. Okay, Vivian says Grace is flirting with someone on the phone. Grace claims it's her doctor. Could my daughter be jealous? Marcus pondered. He understood that Vivian wouldn't ruin their relationship just like that. She always sought his support and understanding. But this morning he had disappointed her greatly, even without properly listening. Even if Grace had indeed called her gynecologist, Vivian's constant complaints about insults from her stepmother provided grounds for investigation. 
he needed to figure out how to organize this. He thought for a little while, staring at the ceiling, then picked up his phone from the desk and called his daughter. Hello, Vivian, he said apologetically when his daughter answered. Where are you right now? At Roddy's, she replied. Roddy was her boyfriend, a reliable young man. Can we meet today? Marcus removed his glasses and rubbed his brow. I want to talk to you. The tone of her father's voice suggested to the girl that he wasn't angry but wanted to listen to her and possibly apologize. So she agreed, and they arranged to meet in the park in the city center. Quickly descending the stairs, Marcus threw on a jacket and shouted into the living room. Darling, I'm leaving. Partners urgently called for a meeting. They can't sort out the assets. Grace emerged from the living room. Are you going to be gone for long? I'm not sure. Some issues have come up. If I'm gone for a while, you can go to bed, he said thoughtfully, pretending it was all insignificant. All right, dear, Grace smiled, as if there was no tension at all. Marcus left the house and headed to the park. The drive took about an hour and a half due to traffic, but he was in a hurry, fearing he might make Vivian wait. He felt with all his heart that something was wrong. When he arrived, parked near the entrance, and called his daughter. I'm here. Where are you? he asked. By the entrance, on a bench, Vivian replied. Marcus got out of the car, walked into the park, and waved to his daughter when he saw her. Vivian. He called out as he got closer. She politely scooted over on the bench to make room for him. Vivian. He began sitting down on the wooden bench. I'm sorry, I should have listened to you. Dad, I understand everything. The girl replied, but I didn't expect this. Thanks to Roddy, at least he calmed me down. I'm sorry again, Vivian. I want to listen to you. I realize that you can't just. He wanted to say lie to me, but decided not to aggravate the situation. Upset me. What exactly did you dislike today? Marcus asked. Taking a deep breath, the girl began recounting the situation as if she were reliving it. I went to the kitchen to make myself coffee. I saw her standing there, talking on the phone with someone. Apparently, she was so focused on the conversation that she didn't hear me come in. I immediately suspected something. It's unlikely she would giggle shyly with one of her friends, but I decided to stay and listen to what she was saying. From what I gathered, someone really wanted to meet her, just couldn't wait. Then she said something about a jerk, something like that. She paused, recalling what happened next. And then she said she didn't know when they'd be able to meet because some jerk was getting in their way again. So I ran to tell you. Dad, I'm sorry. I understand you love her, and it's hard to believe, but it seems to me that she has a lover. And the jerk. She meant me. Marcus said in a sad voice. Yes, Dad, she continued. That's what I wanted to say. I should have probably guessed it as soon as she started bothering me. If she doesn't love your child, she probably doesn't love you either, Vivian added. I need to be 100% sure about this. I lied to her about going to an urgent meeting, made up something, and she believed it. I think she was even happy when she found out I was leaving, noted Marcus. I think so, too. I need to check her to be absolutely sure, and then I can discuss it with her with all the arguments and facts. Vivian said nothing, and a silence hung in the air. I can't prove it, but I'm sure she's cheating on you, the girl added. Well, there are many cheaters, but how can you cheat on someone whose child you're carrying? Vivian pondered. I don't understand it either. She began, but Marcus interrupted her. No, I'm 100% sure the child is mine. He looked off into the distance of the park. 
she's up to something you were right this morning. I need to find out, set up surveillance, but how to do it without her noticing? Another silence fell. Deep in thought, Vivian stared blankly into the distance. Dad, she finally said, I never considered this before, but it might really help you now. What is it? Marcus looked at his daughter attentively. Do we have any internal cameras at home? Now the girl's face seemed to be glowing with the idea. If we do, you can just set up their view on your phone. Vivian, that's brilliant. Marcus responded, shocked. No, we don't have any cameras at home, but I'll install them soon. Yes, that's it. Look. I'll set up cameras all over the house so she won't notice them, and I'll pretend to be on a business trip for three days. I'll say that there were serious issues at the meeting and I need to urgently visit more important partners. She doesn't know anything about this, so it will be easy to fool her. And while I'm supposedly away, I'll monitor her behavior at home. Good idea, Dad, Vivian exclaimed. I think it would be even better to place a camera in the car. We'll do that too. Something sparkled in Marcus's eyes. He was obsessed with the idea. All right, I need to call the hotel, book a room for three days. I'll take my laptop with me. It will be easier to monitor the cameras. By eight in the evening, Marcus returned home. It was decided that Vivian would stay at her boyfriend's place for now to simulate separation from Grace. Entering the house, he heard his wife quickly saying goodbye to someone and then rushing to greet him. Hi, darling, Grace said, trying to win her husband over. How are you? What's going on with the partners? Kissing her on the lips, Marcus replied. It's a complete mess. They've messed up something and I have to sort it out. I'm going on a business trip. There's work for three days. To add to the effect, he sighed wearily. What a disaster, my poor one. Grace responded. You're already so tired. And Vivian's been getting on your nerves, too. Haven't you talked to her? Do you think I had time for that? Marcus answered with a touch of reproach. It's impossible to have a normal conversation with these idiots. They're always messing things up. And with Vivian. Dot dash, he waved his hand. I see, Grace said slightly more cheerfully. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I would have left tonight, but I'm so exhausted I need to rest. I'll pack my suitcase, take a shower, and go to bed. Go on, go rest. You look tired. Grace tried to motivate him. Yeah, tired, Dot Dash Marcus replied, heading up the stairs. Don't disturb me, please, I just want to rest from everyone. Of course, dear, I won't distract you. Go and rest. Grace didn't follow her husband upstairs but immediately turned and ran to the living room. As soon as she was out of sight, Marcus quickened his pace towards the bedroom. He felt that the top closet in the bedroom was full of clothes, even though he had just thrown some random things in there. After closing the suitcase, Marcus decided to roll it to the entrance immediately. Struggling to bring it down the spiral staircase, he placed the suitcase by the door and then went out onto the veranda. It was only now that he reflected on how this luxurious high-tech house was only his because of his first wife. If she hadn't helped him with the business and arranged things with Mr. Fisher, who started cooperating with him after her death, he might not have had this house. Today, remembering the day Sophie died, he began to appreciate her again. Lost in his thoughts, Marcus suddenly realized that his current wife was living off his previous one. Grace didn't work anywhere, only occasionally trying to make some money online, but those attempts were very sporadic. At one point, as Marcus realized he was thinking too deeply, he walked to the car he had parked in the garage. Installing the camera in Grace's car was quite easy since it was parked next to his own. He pulled out a set of surveillance cameras from the glove compartment and got into his wife's car. Where to hide it? He thought, scanning the interior of the expensive car. 
His gaze fell on the rearview mirror, and he decided that the camera would go there, as it was small and not easy to spot. Attaching the camera to the mirror's mount just below the ceiling, so it could capture the entire car interior, including the back seats Marcus got out of his wife's vehicle. The job started, he thought, understanding he now needed to be extremely careful in placing cameras around the house. After leaving the garage and standing on the veranda for a couple more minutes, he went back inside. Grace didn't ask any questions and was engrossed in watching a TV series, which was definitely to Marcus's advantage. He had four cameras left and decided to place them in the main rooms of the large house. Placing a camera in the kitchen was not a problem. He attached a camera with adhesive mounting to the microwave, which was buried among various kitchen utensils. Then he went to the bathroom. There, he placed a camera on top of a small cabinet, where the family usually kept supplies of toilet paper, toothpaste, and shampoos. The remaining task was to place a camera in the living room, which was the most challenging. It needed to cover the entire room, so it had to be placed in one of the corners. The only option was to somehow distract Grace from watching the TV series and lead her to another room. The most effective strategy seemed to be calling her to the kitchen. But Marcus didn't have anyone else. Of course he could have asked Vivian to do this, but then Grace wouldn't have left the room. Instead, she would have started speaking as loudly as possible so that Marcus could see her friendly attitude towards the girl. But then another good plan came to mind. Marcus decided to enter the room, continue pretending to be very tired, and ask his wife to make him coffee. This plan seemed workable, so he decided to try it, slowly entering the room with half-closed eyes making him amusingly resemble a zombie, he sat in a chair and said as loudly as possible, Dear, make me some coffee. It worked, and the medium-height brunette with a great figure and very beautiful eyes got up from the couch and went to the kitchen. It was a good moment to hide the camera he just needed to decide on its future location. Marcus, Glancing through the doorframe into the kitchen, quickly jumped out of the chair, ran to the huge plasma TV standing on a low dresser, and quickly attached the camera underneath so that it covered the entire room. Then, as quickly as he had stood up, he sat back in the chair, once again showing his exhaustion. His wife returned in less than a minute and told him that she had filled the kettle with water and set it to boil. Thank you very much. Marcus replied to his wife. I'll go now. All right, Grace said with a smile. Marcus walked slowly, mostly looking at the floor, out of the living room and headed towards the stairs. Once on the second floor, he quickened his pace and hurried into his study. He needed to connect his laptop to the cameras to monitor the situation at home. He quickly settled into a chair, opened the laptop, and turned it on. After some fiddling with the programs, he managed to get it set up. Got it, Marcus whispered, seeing the live feed from the cameras, including his wife watching TV. Wow, I can even track the camera battery levels. That should be enough for a few days. Perfect. There was one last camera to set up, and Marcus decided to place it in their bedroom. Entering the room, he didn't fuss and simply attached it to the back of the mirror on the vanity, ensuring the angle covered the entire room. Everything is perfect, he said when he returned to his study and checked the laptop again. Now all he had to do was wait. The next morning, Marcus woke up earlier than usual. He was eager to leave the house for the hotel for three days and keep an eye on his wife in his absence. While Grace was still asleep, he got up, dressed, got ready, grabbed the laptop he hadn't packed the day before, and left a note saying he would be back in three days. The car clock showed 7.32 a.m., meaning Grace would start living her independent life in just half an hour, and he was keen to observe it. Marcus arrived at the four-star hotel slightly later than his wife woke up. 
he didn't want to delay, so he quickly handed the car to the valet to park and went inside with his suitcase. At the reception, he gave his last name, mentioned he had booked a room for three days yesterday, paid for his stay, and got the keys. Finally, he asked the manager to ensure the maids didn't disturb him, to which the manager nodded understandingly. As soon as Marcus got to his room, he immediately took off his coat, pulled the laptop out of his suitcase, set it on a low table in the middle of the room, and turned it on. He couldn't afford to be late, he might miss a small but crucial detail. Launching the necessary program, he looked at the cameras. Grace wasn't in the bedroom, she was in the kitchen making coffee. Marcus knew she liked coffee in the morning, but he didn't know she also liked chatting with someone while smiling sweetly, suspicious. Well, let's keep watching, he thought. Grace, looking as happy as a young girl hugging her high school boyfriend, continued to smile and look at her phone. On the one hand, Marcus felt uncomfortable watching this, as he was directly witnessing his wife's infidelity. But on the other hand, he understood that discovering this now, under these circumstances, would definitely work to his advantage. Grace put her ear to the phone while stirring her coffee with her free hand. Hello, Marcus heard his wife's voice, her smile stretching even further. Good morning, darling. Yes, he left on a business trip for three days. He was called away urgently. And what difference does it make where he went? His daughter isn't hanging around either, they had a fight. And she can't stand me, you know that. So, she smiled and laughed. Dot, 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 you can come over even today. Well, what a bitch, Marcus exclaimed. I've been harboring this snake on my neck. Feelings needed to be let out the realization that your wife is cheating on you is a very unpleasant one. And Marcus knew that well. He walked around the room for a bit, waved his arms in the air, then returned to the laptop. His wife was still talking on the phone. Yes, of course, darling. She cooed. Yes, I'll open the gate for you. All right, I'll be waiting, kisses after these words. She made a kissing sound as if sending a kiss to her interlocutor, hung up, and went to the living room. Gold digger. God, why didn't I notice this earlier? Marcus fumed. She does nothing all day, lives off me and dares off me, and dares to cheat on me. After another five minutes of watching the camera feed and realizing that nothing gripping was about to happen, Marcus decided to call his daughter. Hello, Vivian. Did I wake you? He said into the phone. No, she replied. Good. I'm already at the hotel, keeping an eye on this bitch. Yes, you were right, dot dash dash, someone else will be in our house soon. After explaining the situation to his daughter, he continued to watch. Nothing interesting was happening. Grace was just sitting and watching TV. Marcus then thought about what he would do when the outsider arrived at their house. He suspected that this person was Grace's gynecologist, Mr. Travis, a slender and physically weak man who seemed like someone Marcus could clearly explain that he wasn't welcome in the house. The most straightforward option would be to go there himself and catch the couple in the act, but he wanted to play the spy a bit. Then a seemingly brilliant idea came to him to ask Vivian to go home. This action would allow him to address another issue Vivian's humiliation by grace. But Vivian had to arrive home before the gynecologist, so Marcus nervously dialed his daughter's number. Vivian. He tried to steady himself. Yes, Dad, she answered immediately. Did you forget something? No, Vivian, I've thought of something. Are you very busy right now? No. Can you help me? After explaining his idea, Vivian approved it. For such a purpose, she was willing to endure a bit more conflict with her stepmother. She quickly packed and went home. The trip took about an hour without traffic so she was likely to arrive before Grace's lover. An hour and a bit had passed since the conversation with Vivian. Marcus watched the cameras, rubbing his hands together. He was eager to teach his wife a lesson, catch her red-handed, 
and then kick her out of the house and file for divorce. He couldn't tolerate such a betrayal. And then Vivian appeared on the cameras. She entered the house, and Marcus, who had been tired of watching Grace merely watch TV, became animated and watched the unfolding events with interest. Darling, is that you? Grace's voice came from the living room. You came back so quickly? How did you get in? The gate is closed, Grace asked, confused. It's me, Vivian, the daughter replied. Grace didn't respond, hearing the girl's voice. She silently got up from the couch and went to the hallway connected to the kitchen. What are you doing here? The woman asked with a touch of irritation. Your father isn't here. Where is he? Vivian asked. He went on a business trip for three days. And you should leave. I wasn't expecting you. Grace said with hatred. What does it matter to me? Vivian fired back. This is also my house. If I want, I come. I actually came to talk to Dad, but since he's not here, it's no big deal. I'll wait three days. The last sentence sounded very confident, and Marcus, hearing it, felt proud of his daughter. I don't want you here. Grace started yelling. Get out. No, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to my room upstairs. Vivian calmly replied to her stepmother's outbursts. Good job, keep it up. Marcus thought, cheering for his daughter from the other side of the city. He had no doubts about Vivian's fighting spirit and was confident that she would put the annoying stepmother in her place. I don't care if it's easier or harder for you. I said get out of here, you goat. I never want to see you here again, and don't even think about reconciling with your father. Dash dash is not going to happen. You shouldn't get upset, the girl remarked, stepping back. You're pregnant, after all, she added with a smile. A wave of pride for his daughter swept over Marcus. Thank yourself for why I'm upset right now. If it weren't for you, I'd be calm. Get out and stop messing with my head, Grace shouted, pointing at the door. Got it, Vivian sighed. We can't have a normal conversation. Goodbye, dear. I'll tell Dad how you spoke to me. As if he'll believe you, you. Go ahead, try, little witch. Goodbye again. Vivian sang sweetly as she walked out of the house. Grace stood in the hallway for a moment, glanced out the window after her stepdaughter, and muttered something under her breath. Then she pulled out her phone and began calling someone. Hello, darling, she said. Are you coming soon? I'm tired of waiting for you. Yeah, some sketchy people showed up. That ugly one came by. You're the ugly one, Marcus thought, leaning back on the couch. All right, I'll wait for you. Don't take too long, Grace added, smiling playfully as she hung up the phone. At that moment, Marcus heard his phone ring and saw it was Vivian calling. Dad, did you see that? she asked. I saw it, honey. I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I'll deal with her soon, just waiting for her lover to show up. And what are you going to do when he shows up? It's simple. He arrives, I arrive, and I punch him in the face. She's carrying my child, so I can't do the same to her, but otherwise I'd throw her out, just like she did to you. Dad, she needs to be thrown out. Vivian insisted. Marcus was already tired of staring at the laptop monitor, watching his wife do nothing productive. But then the moment arrived Grace's phone rang. From her replies, Marcus gathered that the gynecologist had arrived and was asking her to open the gate. Yes, darling, I'm coming, she said, jumping up from the couch. Wait just a moment. I'll open it now. Marcus felt adrenaline boiling inside him. Grace left the house and disappeared for a couple of minutes. 
Then two figures appeared on the camera. The first was Grace, but the second person seemed unfamiliar to Marcus, a short, stocky man. This definitely wasn't the gynecologist. Finally, I don't have to hide anymore, Grace said, turning to her lover. Yeah. Here, yeah, honey, he replied. Staring at the monitor, Marcus tried to figure out who this man was. A moment later, shock washed over him. It was Ralph, Mr. Fisher. Should I make you some coffee? Grace asked. Forget your coffee, honey, Ralph replied, looking around the house. What a mansion! Even I can't afford something like this. Good thing I took care of everything back then. We had to get rid of that fool otherwise. It would have been more difficult now. Marcus understood. He had killed Sophie. The shock struck him to his core. Yes, yes, Ralph. Grace cooed. You're the smartest. Now we just need to outsmart that fool. Why bother outsmarting him? Ralph asked. Just get rid of him, and that's it. I've got connections in the police. We've got time, Grace said confidently. We've thought it all through. It's simple, Ralph said. We get rid of him and all the property goes to you. Then we get together and we've got a magnificent mansion. We'll raise our child. It's all very simple. And how do we get rid of him? Grace asked. An accident, poisoning, an unfortunate incident, anything. Ralph began listing off. Marcus couldn't believe his ears. Everything was falling into place. Ralph had killed Sophie to gain control of Marcus's business. Marcus couldn't wait any longer. He quickly grabbed his coat and rushed out of the apartment. As he descended to the lobby, he called his daughter. Vivian, this is urgent. Are you at Roddy's yet? Good. Turn the taxi around and head home, but don't go inside. Wait for either me or my call. He ended the call and, after asking the porter to bring his car from the parking lot, started thinking. His mind raced with thoughts of a confrontation with Mr. Fisher. He needed to come up with a plan, something to say and do when he got home. First, he'd tell Vivian everything. The details about Sophie could come later. He didn't want to upset her before everything was sorted out. Then he'd figure out how to deal with those snakes. As he drove home, Marcus grew more and more anxious. What if Mr. Fisher had brought security? What if he was armed? What if they planned to get rid of him and Vivian? Ralph had connections everywhere they could kill them both without consequence. It was a dire situation, and Marcus knew he had to act immediately. As he approached the house, he saw Vivian standing by the gates. There were no other cars around, meaning Ralph had come alone. Vivian. Marcus called as he got out of the car. Don't go inside. I need to tell you everything. Dad, what's going on? she asked. Horrible things are happening. Those scum, sorry, there's no other way to say it, are plotting against me. I had a business partner who now wants to take everything I've worked for. Grace is just a pawn a puppet in his hands. They want to get rid of me, and they might try to get rid of you too. I'm going in to deal with them now. I don't want you to get hurt, but I don't think I can do this without you. They're very cunning. I have recordings of their conversation on my laptop. If anything happens, run to the hotel, grab the laptop, and go to the authorities with it. I understand, Dad, Vivian said. She didn't make a scene. She quickly prepared herself mentally for the unpredictable. All right, stay in the car. If I don't come out soon, you know what to do. No, I'm coming with you, she said firmly. Dad, I'm not leaving you. We've been through so much together, and we'll get through this too. Marcus looked into his daughter's eyes. They sparkled with determination. All right, stay behind me. They might have weapons. 
they cautiously entered the courtyard of their mansion. They had to move carefully across their own property. A black luxury car with tinted, bulletproof windows stood in the yard. It was Mr. Fisher's car. They made their way to the house without incident and then stepped inside. Grace heard the door open in the living room, where she was sitting with her lover, and some whispering followed. Ah, Marcus, Grace said with aggression in her voice, appearing in the doorway, weren't you supposed to be on a business trip? Where's your suitcase? Where's your conscience? Marcus shot back. Answer me this first, why did you kick Vivian out? His voice was serious, and although he appeared confident, there was an unmistakable sense of danger in the air. When did I do that? Grace looked at her husband in surprise. Just a couple of hours ago. Vivian, why do you keep lying and trying to slander me in front of your father? Grace turned on her stepdaughter, and Marcus found her attitude unbelievably brazen. When did I kick you out? You haven't even been home. I don't understand a thing. Oh, you understand perfectly, you snake. Marcus defended his daughter. I know very well that you threw her out and told her never to come back. But that's only half the problem. Now tell me, what is he doing here? Marcus pointed to the doorway. Mr. Fisher came here because he thought you were home. I met him and offered him coffee. What's wrong with that? Grace tried her best to pretend that nothing extraordinary had happened and made Marcus look like a complete fool. And as she thought, she was doing quite well. She just didn't know the whole story. Ralph, come here. What are you hiding there for? I won't hit you, yet, said Marcus. Ralph immediately appeared in the doorway, buttoning his jacket. He walked confidently out of the room. Hello. He extended his hand, but Marcus refused to shake it. I don't understand what's going on here. I came, and no one was home. Your wife met me and offered me coffee. I'm here to discuss further business opportunities with you. Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes, Marcus shouted. I know perfectly well what you two were discussing and why you came here, you scumbag. Don't try to wriggle out of it. What are you talking about, darling? Grace intervened. Mr. Fisher did come to discuss. Stay out of this, yelled Vivian, who was standing slightly behind her father. Let them sort it out. Why are you butting in? Are you out of your mind? Grace raised her voice, but Marcus quickly cut her off. Listen here, chicken. If a single hair falls from my daughter's head, you'll regret it deeply. If I were you, I'd just stand there and stay quiet. Got it. Now you, Ralph. As of tomorrow, our company is terminating all contracts and agreements with you. That's the first thing. Second, you're taking this fool with you and getting the hell out of here. Understood? What's this nonsense? snapped Mr. Fisher. How dare you talk to me like that, you little punk? Do you even know what I can do to you? Do you know what I can do to you? I have all the evidence of your dirty deals, Marcus replied. You got a lot of influence around here, sure, but listen to me. I'm not as simple as I may seem. If you don't leave right now with her, my evidence will reach far beyond your circle of influence. For a couple of moments there was silence and then a sigh came from somewhere to the right. Oh, I feel faint, Grace moaned, clutching her stomach. I'm not feeling well. I shouldn't be stressed, Marcus. Stop this. Why should I care about your condition? Marcus said. The child isn't mine, so I have no reason to worry. Now, if you didn't catch what I said earlier, get out of here. I'm giving you one last chance. Mr. Fisher stared directly into his opponent's eyes, then walked past him toward the exit. We'll see who really has more influence here, kid. 
he put on his coat and left the house, slamming the door loudly. Marcus turned to Grace in a harsh tone. Didn't I make myself clear? You're leaving too. Marcus, don't yell. You're hurting our child. I'm going to faint. Our child. Marcus latched onto the word. Let's do a paternity test. I won't do a test. Why not, if it's our child, like you say? Does Mr. Fisher think the child is his? Why would you say that? Grace almost sobbed. Marcus then walked over to a set of kitchen cabinets, where a microwave stood, and pulled out a hidden camera. Showing it to his wife, he said colon dot dash, that's why, and yes, it records audio too. You. Grace's face changed dramatically. You've just ruined my entire life. Don't worry, I'll still sue you for this house and the entire business, she said calmly, shaking her head. That won't happen, dear, that won't happen. You bastard. I'll make your life hell. Grace stormed into the living room, grabbed her phone, and came back to the exit. As she put on her jacket, she continued her rant. We'll see who gets this house when they take you out. She screamed as she left the house. Grace, if you didn't notice, the camera recorded everything, said Vivian, to her father's surprise. You've just talked yourself into a long sentence. Did you hear that? Marcus calmly asked his daughter once his wife was off the property. She's planning to get rid of me, but I'm the one who's ruined her life. I told you. So what are you going to do next? Ignoring her father's question, Vivian said, I'm taking the laptop to the police. There's nothing else to be done. I'm not letting this slide. They need to know their place with this Fisher. And now do you see what a good actress she is, Dad? Aren't you afraid she might actually sue you for something? What could she sue me for? Marcus looked surprised. I bought the house before the marriage, and the business even more so. No, even if they wanted to, they won't get anything from me. Some time passed. Marcus told his daughter that Ralph Fisher, in addition to planning his death to take over the business, had also orchestrated her mother's death. Vivian reacted to this very painfully and had to take sedatives for several days. Marcus felt guilty as well because if it hadn't been for the business, she might still be alive. But Vivian denied this, saying he wasn't responsible for Ralph Fisher's greed and wickedness, as Ralph was willing to sacrifice human lives for his own gain. Later, this led to certain consequences for Ralph Fisher, whose business began to collapse after all the contracts were terminated. Along with the dwindling money, his useful connections also started to fade. Marcus finalized the divorce a month later. He had been busy finishing a major project for his own clothing line and simply hadn't had time for the divorce. Grace still tried to show herself, insisting that he had beaten and humiliated her, but the court sided with Marcus. Then she tried to sue for a share of his business or a piece of his expensive home, but of course she failed. After these futile attempts to harm her ex-husband, she disappeared from his life, and her fate became unknown to Marcus. Naturally, he couldn't let the attempt on his life go unpunished, but with Ralph Fisher losing all his power and grace having vanished, Marcus filed a lawsuit. After consulting his lawyer, Marcus found out he had a 100% chance of winning the case and that the guilty parties would surely face justice. And that's exactly what happened. After a long trial, the judge delivered a verdict, and none of Ralph's former high-ranking connections could save him. In the near future, Marcus didn't plan on remarrying, understanding that with his wealth, it would be hard to find a truly loyal partner. And besides, he didn't have the time. He needed to constantly grow and develop his business. Soon, his retail network expanded to a regional level, profits soared again, and employee salaries in his company increased, which brought Marcus great joy.
In time, Vivian and Roddy got married. Marcus met his in-laws, who turned out to be wonderful people, and shortly after the wedding, he found out that his daughter was expecting a child. The joy of becoming a grandfather was overwhelming. Thus, Marcus's life became a harmonious blend of business success and warm family relationships. He realized that true wealth wasn't just about material possessions, but also about the love, support, and happiness he found in his family. And every new day brought him satisfaction and joy as he shared this happiness with his loved ones, starting fresh and creating new, joyful chapters in his life. Thank you for listening to the story till the end. Please support the channel with a like. It won't take much effort, but it means a lot to me. See you next time.